This weekend, Trump raised the specter of a ban on the social media platform TikTok. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. We may be doing some other things or a couple of options, but a lot of things are happening. So we'll see what happens. But we are looking at a lot of alternatives with respect to TikTok. So he left left room for doubt when speaking to reporters on Air Force One. So then instead of saying we're looking at a lot of options, he said, as far as TikTok is concerned, we're banning them from the United States. Um, so I suppose no, no ambiguity there. Um, the political incentives for such a move are obvious. He's about to fight a presidential campaign on the main issues of the day, the economy and coronavirus. It's going appallingly for him. He is tanking. He wants to change the subject. And what better way to change the subject than to point at some country that you can make out to be an enemy and a threat. Um, unfortunately, he's also getting very little opposition on this point from his political opponents. This is Chuck Schumer, the Democrats leader in the Senate speaking on Sunday. I have been very opposed to TikTok. I was one of the first to expose the Chinese links. And I have urged that TikTok be closed down in America. There's a new proposal. Mnuchin and Meadows brought it up yesterday to have Microsoft take it over. There are some questions that have to be answered. How will the data be stored and secured? Do the Chinese, will still the Chinese have links into TikTok? So before I would be for such a merger, I'd have to get some answers to these questions. I love the way he's, he's exposed the Chinese links of TikTok. It's a Chinese company. Everyone knew that. You, what did he, he just read the New York Times and then tweeted about it. Who knows what he's talking about? Um, anyway, I mean, with Aaron, I'll talk a bit about the politicking of this in, in the United States. But first of all, I wanted to know the actual facts, not just, um, I suppose, whatever Donald Trump and Chuck Schumer are spouting. So earlier today, um, I spoke to Yuan Yang, who is the FT's Beijing Deputy Bureau Chief and also a tech correspondent, so the perfect person to speak to on this topic. So I started by asking her whether TikTok does pose any genuine security threat to users in the United States. So some US politicians have argued that TikTok could be spying on its users' data. Now, they haven't presented any evidence to show that this could be the case, so right now it's completely hypothetical. All the evidence that we do know so far of how TikTok, the app, works is that, yes, it takes user data and it siphons off huge amounts of user data. But that isn't so different to what existing U.S. social media apps like Twitter, like Facebook already do. And that is simply the model of how social media apps monetize user data by selling it to advertisers or, as Shoshana Zuboff calls it, surveillance capitalism. That's the widespread model. Now, the added concern is, is, of course, for a Chinese company that U.S. users or U.S. politicians fear that China, if it got its hands on this data, could be using it for other nefarious means. We, so far, that is pure speculation. I think that rather than being a national security concern with evidence back that up, TikTok is instead being used as more of a political football to be kicked around. Mm, I mean, the other argument I've heard, which I didn't find that convincing, I have to admit, was was mm. that they can control the algorithm. So the idea is you could have this Chinese company that's um, showing people, I suppose, anti-American propaganda and hiding posts about the Uyghurs, for example. I mean, again, right. is there any evidence for that at all? There is grounds for concern about Chinese censorship because partly because China censors so uh, much data, so much content within its own borders. So Douyin, which is the Chinese internal equivalent of TikTok and was the kind of predecessor to TikTok, does huge amounts of censorship on everything from the uh, Uyghur uh, mass concentration camps in Xinjiang to the distance that have been locked up by the government uh, to Hong Kong independence on a huge range of political themes. Now, ByteDance say that they have separated out the non-China content moderation from the China content moderation. And we haven't seen any obvious and clear examples of political censorship on the app. There is the possibility that the algorithm could be tweaked and changed in a disinformation campaign, for example, to try and change the way that US voters turn out. That hasn't been shown to be the case so far. And partly because the app's users are so young and usually are teenagers below uh, voting age, I don't think it's as big a concern as the kind of clear disinformation campaigns that we can get on Twitter, which Twitter has also uh, named and shamed coming from China, coming from Russia that already exist. We've already seen now just in the last year, the UK turning against Huawei, America sort of 
constantly expanding the list of companies it doesn't want to operate in the United States. Is this a serious problem for the Chinese economy or, you know, I suppose is it big enough to just go it alone at this point? I think Huawei and TikTok are very different when it comes to the impact on China's development. Huawei is much more important. It's a company that's built China's telecoms infrastructure. It's enabled the mobile revolution. It's built out all the internet coverage across vast ways of China, including rural parts of China that previously had no internet coverage. And because it's a manufacturing company, it makes smartphones, it makes telecoms masts. It also indirectly employs lots of factory workers. Now, ByteDance and TikTok is a very different uh, is in a very different situation. They are not actually making that much profit outside of China because they're still in the expansion phase of you know this new tech startup that's trying to gain users. Um, they employ not that many people compared to a manufacturing company. They employ predominantly uh, elite graduate students um, in big cities. So as a software company, they have much of a smaller impact on China's economy. Now, there is a class of people within China that will be affected by the threatened ban and by this potential sale. And those are going to be the young entrepreneurs, often who have been educated abroad, who've been sold this idea that they too can be international citizens, that they can play on a level playing field with their American counterparts. And culturally speaking, those kinds of young Chinese entrepreneurs are going to be much more similar to their Silicon Valley counterparts than to any other part of China's uh, political class. Um, they're going to be born in, after the 70s or in, after the 80s, the younger generation of entrepreneurs, and they will be very disappointed. But they are not President Xi and the Communist Party's you know, main um, audience for its policies. The Communist Party still um, has its, has its uh, biggest groundswell of support among rural farmers among people who have seen their livelihoods changed uh, over the last few decades by the party and increasingly is uh, is you know, facing more uh, discontent from this uh, elite class from the university educated groups in China. So although that group of entrepreneurs is going to be disappointed, and I think they would quite rightfully feel a grievance about the US closing its doors to them, they're not the major concern of the Communist Party yet. That was Yuan Yang, Deputy Beijing Bureau Chief for the FT, speaking to me from Beijing earlier today. Aaron, I want to go to you sort of to talk about the, the politics of this in the West, I suppose, because what you're seeing in the United States is there's complete bipartisan consensus on the idea mm. of being really hawkish about China. So you saw at the beginning that you know Donald Trump was trying to target Biden, seeing a weakness for him is that potentially he's soft on China, Biden doing adverts sort of saying that actually, no, Donald Trump is soft on China. There's this huge race to be toughest. Yeah. Who can be toughest on China? And it seems like I don't know where it really ends. I can understand why they're all doing it. I can understand why Joe Biden and the Democrats are trying to close down any wedge issue they think Donald Trump might be able to find to win um, a new presidential term. But it also seems incredibly dangerous. Well, lots of this doesn't make sense. You know, there's a story out a few days ago in The Guardian about uh, the Five Eyes network, which is Britain, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, which is effectively a signal intelligence network, a spying network. They share lots of sort of surveillance data, primarily the Americans and the British are generating that, obviously. Uh, they were saying this could be expanded to a kind of a, some kind of trade area. There'd be a pooling of resources because obviously people are saying, you know, people are very keen to boycott China until they recognize the fact that it's got 90 percent of the world's known deposits of rare earth minerals. Uh, or the fact that, you know, is Australia really going to uh, say goodbye to China when its number one economic market, its number one trade partner is China? You know, after 2008, without the without the export of of primary mineral resources to mainland China, the Australian economy would have been in the gutter. And so it's a really strange moment, and it, it's kind of unique in the last several hundred years, in that for many countries, their primary military partner is the United States, right? For China, uh, for Australia, its primary military partner is the United States. However, its primary economic partner is China. And what this is doing is actually drawing out a really difficult contradiction there. Now, for somewhere like Britain, it's not such a, a big problem. I mean, we're in the North Atlantic. But for Australia, for Canada to an extent, for New Zealand, for, for pretty much all of Asia, uh, for many European countries, uh, for Eastern European countries, for Iran, the Middle East, Central Asia, you know, it, it's pretty clear what the center of economic gravity is for them. Anybody that's exporting mineral resources from copper in Chile to, you know, uh, Central African Republic and, and Bauxite or Australia, they're looking to China. They're not going to sever economic ties with China. Then when it comes to social networks, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, 
the data from this is going to be powering the deep learning tools of the next 10, 20 years, basic artificial intelligence. And if we look at it, it's a cliche, but it's true. We look at data like oil. It's a hugely valuable resource. Where is this data coming from? It's coming from, like I say, Google, YouTube, Facebook. That's where real value is going to be accumulated over the next couple of decades because it's, it's what's going to power artificial intelligence, deep, these deep learning, machine learning uh, tools and technologies. Now, you need large numbers of people to have an effective AI uh, industry, which means that fundamentally in the 21st century, the two big AI superpowers will be the United States and China because they don't just have the technology, the capital, the know-how, which both do. They also have huge data sets, right? They have huge domestic consumer markets. Now, China has 1.3 billion people. The US has 300 million people. I don't think the US is going to win this game if it tries to isolate China with its big domestic market of 1.3 billion people. It's growing. Consumer demand is still increasing. It's still, a, it's still a growing market. You know, maybe a year ago, this might have made some sense. But now, when America's economy is going into the gutter, when sort of Anglo-American political leadership is, is falling away, uh, China, people are saying China will be the world's largest economy by 2030 on price purchasing parity, already is. But on nominal GDP, people are saying by 2030, COVID might accelerate that by five years. And so it's not such a simple assumption that Australia uh, will just dismiss China and, and plump for you know the Anglo countries uh, when it comes to both military and e economic relations. That's not necessarily going to be priced in. And if they do do it, there's going to have major consequences for five, 10 years, which I would submit would probably generate a domestic political kickback. So it's a really big moment. You know, the, the big development of the last four or 500 years, the biggest development, really, certainly for the last 200, 300 years, and because we're living in it, we don't think about it, is the rise of China as a, as a political power, but also as a military and maritime power. You know, it wasn't that, it's never been that before. The idea of China having global military reach, it's never had that before. It never wanted it before. And so these are really, really unprecedented times. And I think for America, it's not just about political leadership, economic leadership, and military leadership. It's also for that technological leadership. And the story of TikTok is how all of this intersects and dovetails.